This is another presentation of tape-recorded UFO information service. The lecture is a portion of the Long John program heard on November the 25th, 1956 on WOR in New York. Ivan T. Sanderson is a distinguished naturalist, author, and explorer, and he turns to a question asked by hundreds of thousands, what are the UFOs? Sanderson brings a trained scientific mind to the study of this important question as he gives his biological theory of the UFOs. And now here is Mr. Sanderson. Let's get off the reporting and let's start something. That's the man I want to speak to. Um, <laughs> that I'm going to speak very frankly, and I make a little rough sometimes. Uh, I hope that always I will remain within the bounds of, of uh, not magic common decency, but tact. Let us dispose of various problems first of all, and I must explain. Well, let me explain. I'm sick to death of my good pals of business. The woods is full of them. Everybody is... Physicists and mathematicians, uh, mathematicians, and mathematicians today have everything. I might add that he is not a physicist. That was no, a no, wrong introduction on my part. I'm not, uh, not, this is not uh, against your guest last night, but I'm speaking now. I'm off the major case. I'm off Dr. Davidson. I'm off the Blackwood case and everything. Let's get in, into this whole business. You are on Ivan. I'm on the subject of UFOs and a lot more besides. And let me start at the beginning. We are a technological culture in this country and in the Western world, and the whole world is becoming that way. Now, our technology, this is the first moment, started on, on uh, what is called physics, not only the physical sciences, but physics, and the physicists are most honored among the scientists today, at least I suppose mathematicians on top to the kind of theory, and uh, then the physicists, and then down to the chemists. That's Paul is a biologist, we're sort of tagging along. Now, I would just like to point out that, uh, I don't know if you know this, many people in this country don't realize, when I born a black, to realize that I was born and brought up on the other side. I discovered in my dumbfounded amazement only a few years ago that what we call popularly in this country, sound, not sound at all, it's technology, gadgetary, artisanship for the most part. What we call philosophy in this country is what's called pure sound the rest of the world. And what the rest of the world calls philosophy, we call metaphysics in this country. Right. <laughs> All right? Well, let's get right. things straight. Now, about 99% of the physicists, physicists, and I'm not um, saying anything against them, are gadgeteers. They're not scientists at all. Merely by, by it's a matter of semantics. It only takes one Fermi to devise, think out the principles of atom bomb. It takes 100,000 people to put one together. And we live in an age when it's the people who put bombs together that matter. We almost worship them. And I think to the enormous credit of the physicists who underpaid as they are, overworked as they are, have not yet founded an orthodoxy and, or a hierarchy, nor are they bullying people around. They're trying to do a hard job. So they're not scientists. And like chemists, about 25% are probably real scientists. Do you know what the definition of science is? We look it up in, even in Webster. It is the exploration or investigation of the unknown, not of the known. Technology, uh, from Technos, you look that up in the Greek dictionary, and you'll find out that it actually comes down to the further elaboration of, or understanding of, or log of, knowledge of the known, or Technos. Uh, Technoi, I think it is, but anyhow. Um, now, many are really working in the field of pure science. In other words, it's almost, it starts with imagination just like science fiction does, following which comes a hypothesis, out of which may develop a theory, after which you test the theory, and if it works out, you finally have practice. And uh, the chemists are examining real things. Uh, do you realize that the only thing that doesn't exist, the only thing that we know for sure is absolutely true, and that's mathematics, and mathematics, we can't say that word tonight. There is such a thing as mathematics in nature, outside of an intelligent human type mind, doesn't exist. If you add five apples to two apples, you, uh, three apples to two apples, you don't get five apples. There's a lot of, a lot of apples lying on the ground. Uh, mathematics is a very peculiar business, but it is, it is the only thing that's actually true 
and can actually, in every case, be proved right or wrong, despite that horrible little figure, which means possibility, which is now crept in, and infinity. But uh, it's, a, it's a patent science, and it's the only thing that doesn't really exist. Physics is the next one down. Do you know a certain physicist, who will not mention his name, who was one of the people who helped us put the atom bomb together, uh, pointed out to me not so very long ago that when they let off the first experimental uh, atom bomb at Alamogordo, uh, we knew uh, of the existence of 14 less particles in the nucleus than we know now. So really we're sitting around with something we didn't know very much about. So you have a, a lot of theoreticians, or a few theoreticians, people who put the stuff together, and then a mass of technologists. Then you come down to the chemist. Finally you come down to the biologist. And uh, the biology is a little forgotten science, or it's becoming of cycle importance. After all, biology is dealing with facts, which are studying from ourselves on up and on down. And they, uh, the majority of them still have to be scientists. There's a lot of biological technology going on. But uh, on the whole, the biologist has to be a little bit more a little bit more scientific, shall we say, about it. I'm not being snide, I'm simply trying to put the thing, it's a matter of semantics and nothing else, but a lot of people don't understand it. Uh, they think of uh, bending radio sets and putting atom bombs together. It's done, it's not. It's gadgeteering of a very advanced order. Oh, they want the bigger bang than the Russians have got. You get 100,000 people together, you dig the things out of the ground, you put them together in a certain kind of way, and you get your big bang. Uh, but the fairness of this world and the people who think of the theory and develop the theory uh, are exploring the unknown. Now, there's been so little scientific respect shown to this whole subject of what I call ufology. And I think it's about time that, that uh, one of the sciences could find time or space or place to allow this strange subject to be taken in. The meteorologists, the meteorologists don't want it. They're far too busy. And they're concerned with things in our sky, so see, which they have to know about. The astronomers don't want any part of it. Anyhow, they can't see half these things as reported because they're either too far away or too close up. And uh, they don't fit into their scheme of things. The physicists don't want them at all, just like they're part of physics. The chemists are only interested in the chemistry of the sky at all. And so on down the line. Uh, the biologists, least of all, the few people have simply, uh, well, this is obviously not to do with us. And to really, even the psychologists, the psychiatrists, they say, well, bad liquor, uh, mass hallucination, Deflated Navy blimps, I don't know why, I thought, oh, that was my also on the flying, uh, you know, the sea monster thing, that's one of the great explanations of sea monsters. Uh, deflated Navy blimps, the poor Navy must have been getting rid of blimps at the rate of about 400 a year for the last 100 years. Uh, no, but all these kind of, uh, they're really very silly, let's face it. Uh, here, there have been what their old Charles Fort used to call, obviously, OSM. Objects have been floating. I think it's a much nicer connotation to UFOs, unidentified flying objects. Uh, objects being floating, gently or otherwise, in the sky. I would point out that nowadays they're always dashing about in the sky, whereas in the in early days they seem to be just floating there, obviously. Uh, but these types of things have been seen throughout history. And don't think that it's all for the newspaper report. Ford started picking up reports for his book. Uh, he took an article date of 1800. A couple of other gentlemen you mentioned before, uh, uh, Jessup and so on, have dug out reports in Wilkinson. I don't know if remember it's Wilkinson or Wilkinson, I don't know if names. Anyhow, everybody who is interested in this thing will know who I'm talking about. Um, it's gone way back to early Chinese literature. There are quite a bunch of the Bible, you know. Not only the flying wheel in the sky, but Isaiah being taken up in the, in the fiery chariot. Um, people wanted to those days. They weren't frightened of, of what somebody was going to tell them. Uh, that you're, you're lying, you're, you're, you're a hoaxer, and all that. What they, what they saw, or they thought they saw, they said, and they got into print, if there was any print available. The ancient Egyptians have certain very peculiar things they stated, but much more important than that. And I would ask you, and any of you listeners, just go over to the New York Public Library, get a hold of the proceedings of the Royal Society of London, starting with its inception in the late 1700s, and going on up to about 1865, just ruffle through the pages of those proceedings. You will find story after story reported to the Royal Society of London by members of the Royal Society of all kinds of dreary things being seen in the sky. As I said before, about the only shape that never seems to have once been reported yet is that of a saucer. Uh, lenses, uh, things that look like the bottom of lamps, um, lozenge-shaped jobs, 
some white wood wire things, um, cylinders, things that look like kites, uh, cigar shaped objects, lights of all kinds, objects with lights on them, and so on. Um, I really don't think that anybody, except for possibly, possibly the gentleman of the press, and I can't think why they're so against it, any longer really laughs at the fact of there being a lot of things buzzing about in the sky or having been seen in the sky. I mean, to turn around and say it's all nonsense, it's just absurd. On the 30th of October, I stood with 10,000 people uh, out on that, that road watching this alleged balloon. My eyesight was fine, of course, I didn't have any field glasses. It looked awful funny to me. If it was a balloon, it was one ticket for a big one. It certainly wasn't that little small foot job, which was that off in Long Island, because it was in the sky, nearly 100 miles away, half an hour before that one was let off. If it was a sky book that was let off out in Minnesota or wherever they're doing it now, the private corporation is doing it out there, they won't tell us if one was let off, and they won't tell us if the wind was in the wrong direction. So it was a balloon. A lot of people looked at it through field glasses and had something hanging down underneath, all right. But uh, the whole thing, despite the fact that they finally wiped it away, it's so talking about saying it was a balloon. We know it was a balloon. All right, but in the meantime, all these snide remarks about it there, uh, it must have been a balloon. It can't be anything else. Everybody doesn't know what they see, and there's tens of thousands of people looking at it. So you get all these reports in scientific journals, and the Royal Society of London, a pretty seriously minded organization, and always has, I think, been credited with being there. And here they have them in their official journal. You can find them in, in several meteorological journals, which are free for He's not all newspaper clippings, you know. He gives his little references in an awfully funny way, but the references are there. And I've spent days, spent maybe cut out four copies of Charles Ford and card index and cross index every single statement of the nature of those things which I'm particularly interested in on a card index. And I did a lot of, a lot of sitting in the library after I'd been ill for the time, go asking for these, these different journals, not newspapers, and seeing that the things are really in there, and they're there, all right. Well, I think it's funny enough where the actual pages have been torn out of the journals right in the public library. We had to send for a second set and a third set before we could find the proper pagination, and there was the story. Well, it all seems to have come to an end in the Royal Society, for instance, about 1870. They had a wonderful president called Sir David Brewster, uh, who seemed to have had a extremely open mind in the better sense of that word, and that uh, he allowed these things to be published. But about that time, you see, uh, science, or rather technology, was getting going becoming patternized, and you couldn't have things outside the textbook. Uh, it upset the system. I mean, after the series, uh, geological series, it's always been laid down. You couldn't suddenly ask for another two million years jammed in between the Oligocene and the, and the Eocene, for instance. It would upset the whole picture. And until somebody could actually come up and show you a huge block of rock that went in there, the thing is ignored. In other words, they said, look, let's concentrate on what has to be done to get on with technology. We can have scientific thinking forever. So we've got to mention all the sciences, and that seems to work. We'll get rid of the rest. Uh, it's a purely historical uh, gesture, as it were. Now, uh, with, great, uh, with great cause, let me explain why. Am I, am I, am I, am I sort of pontificating too much? No, I uh, There is a need reason for it. Science has a methodology. In addition to being the investigation of the unknown, uh, I doubt if you'll ever get a thing like the occult received into the body of pure science because uh, I'm not interested in the archive, I'm interested in everything. Incidentally, I might throw in that uh, one thing my short life has taught me, that uh, a lot of things are, are improbable, so I don't think anything is impossible. Now, the archive, I don't think, will be included in science because it is not open to measurement, which means in its widest sense that um, if a man says, I have built, invented a vaccine for polio, not only has that vaccine got to prevent polio, but somebody else, using his published account of how he prepared that vaccine, has got to be able to do it in another time and place and come up with the same result. If somebody says, uh, I saw a flying disc over Oregon at 9.10 on the 11th, uh, there's not much you can do about it because it's, uh, it's not a sign of statement in so far that you can't reproduce the disc at any other place at the same time. Uh, that's a very crude way of putting it, and I'm, I'm pitching the rubber band as far as I can to try and make my point. Sound is precise. You've got to be able to weigh and measure the object. At least you've got to be able to reproduce it on the mark. Uh, Dr. J.B. Ryan ran into that great difficulty when he, when he was working on EFT. 
It's got to come on and go off without any kind of regularity. You couldn't definitely just say to me, I look, I've got the following result. And on paper, statistically, with this gentleman sitting in front of me, and with a girl in a room, four, uh, in another room, four rooms away, and then get up and walk out in another investigative take It's probably going to be stopped. It's going to come on and go off. It's going to be very difficult in those borderline investigations. However, the ufology, I believe, is a very much more practical thing than that. I believe it would eventually, or could eventually be subject to a proper analysis and probably measurement in time if people would take the thing seriously. I don't know whether um, any of the Air Forces particularly the Swedes and the Peruvians, I, I continue to stress, because those are the two great areas in the world where these things have, have become so very, very numerous. Uh, I know that the British uh, have grabbed a lot of strange substances that have fallen out of the sky, but there's an actual police report of it, and I think they are also pretty interested. But as I say, once again, we give credit to our Air Force for having come out and done something about it. I don't think that if they're not to be expensive for covering up, if it's anything the other way, they've done a wonderful job trying to find out something and, and putting out these blue books and forth and so on. We'll cover those details after I haven't fixed up in that. But we have overlooked one major fact in trying to be what I'd like to call scientific about it, or at least objective and logical about it. Everybody's dashing about with preconceived ideas, and all of them that I've heard on your program recently have been ideas that are stemming from physics with a little bit of chemistry thrown in, a great deal of cloak and dagger stuff, and a certain amount of publishing business, and all the rest of it. Not one single person has, has thought, has really used their minds and said, now, in the overall, what could these things be? Now, you think I'm going to jump right off this subject for a moment? Say something rather funny. You take me outside, we're at Carteret here. We're not too far away from the turnpike. There's plenty of ordinary soil between, between here and there, despite all the oil. You take me up, any uh, cubic yard of soil, I take soil or anything else for that matter, any way you like. You give it to me to take to a certain a lab, and give me a little bit of money to pay from technicians to examine that that cubic uh, yard of soil. I said the yard, a uh, cubic yard, yard by yard by yard. I can, I think I'm right in saying, and pathologists and various other virologists and so on make correct but I would say there are 10,000 different kinds of life forms in that, that one block of soil. By the time you've taken the bacteria and the little worms and the little insects and the eggs and the, and the, uh, the, the funguses and all the rest of it, well perhaps I'm exaggerating, I don't know, I may be taking a touch of that. But there are thousands of different kinds of life forms living right in that one little bit of soil. Now, the, the different life forms of the surface of this earth are absolutely incredible. There are about a million species of living animals which have Latin names already. The entomologists, the, that is the bug hunters, the, the, the insect people, insects alone, mind you, I'm not talking of crustaceans or the spider group, the arachnids or the centipedes, which are also jointed to legged animals, but the insects alone are, are half that number, at 500,000. And the entomologists assure us that we've only got about one-ninth of those yet to be discovered on the surface of this earth. That's insects alone. There are 25,000 species of no known species of beetles in the British Isles alone. I may astonish you to know that there are 822 species and subspecies of mammals indigenous to North America, the United States, of which over half are rats. Rats in the wide sense, rats and mice. Now, this business of UFOs. The air I think is they're blind sources, they're this, they're that. They are probably of such innumerable different kinds and different origins that it will take an enormous science to do anything about it, simply to catalog these two things. And I absolutely refuse to give any opinion. Have you a point coming out? Um, to say that they're, I certainly will definitely say they're not all one thing. They're not all two things. They're probably hundreds. Now, I, I'm going to uh, put a rather fast one on you, John. I, we were talking about such interesting things of different nature coming out here tonight. I've, I've got the finest set of UFO photographs, I'm sure, that you've ever seen right here. With them, I hope to make a point that I have been working up to. You may have guessed what it is. If you haven't, don't give it away to your listeners. I'm going to show you these photographs in a certain order. Uh, they are set up on cards 
And uh, we'd have to do this. We'd have to do the video as well as the audio right here. They're set up on cards with a piece of uh, with little windows cut in a cover. And I want to show you uh, them to you one at a time. And if you have any violent comments, make them. But I'll turn you off if I think you're going the wrong way. Uh, this is demonstrating a point. May I pass to Sylvia first? Please pass them on to, to John. If you want to make any comments, that is, a, of course, an ordinary, uh, that I would say almost would be a damn style. It's little round things underneath. Well, must, must I assume that these are uh, what you would call reliable kinds of fine objects? No, I didn't say that. I said they're, they're reliable, already published photographs, which I imagine the Air Force must have seen. They may have done, they may not have had the money to get on to it. Here is one of those jobs which has uh, these portals all around the side. I think I know what it is, and I can't say anything. All right. Uh, what do you think that is? Is there some uh, particular... Well, that uh, looks like some sort of up or down. Mr. Lister, that's the bottom. That's, that's the bottom. That's my down. Now, here is a photograph of the same object taken with uh, infrared, and I think with another light. They're most of uh, light. They're ones with light, of course. Oh, I'm so tempted to work. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. There's another one. Now, there's, uh, that's the type which has first been seen down in Florida. The only comment I can make at the moment is I've never seen any pictures like these, any photographs, as far as flying saucers are concerned. Doesn't that look like an empty? Uh, yeah, that, that type. The one, and then uh, the port light ones along the side. Uh, yes, and you might even call, uh, you might even say this is a ping, ball, a ping pong ball base. Uh, and a small one. Yeah, a small one. That's what I thought. Like the 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 Mind you, there's, there's, um, there's a gag in this, not a trick. Do you, okay. uh, you remember the case in the South of France where these little things in pairs came out of that cylinder that uh, Michel mentioned in his book? Do you remember that? No. Yeah. Objects of that nature. Uh, you remember you read that, I think they called it angel hair, was it? That's it, and then the angel hair fell out of it. Of course, there's, uh, I have seen some of the ones photographs taken out west. In fact, the, the part of the government film, the color one, was taken by a friend of mine, Tex Ziegler, uh, the round blue thing. Of course, the zip will give this away. Now you can set the last one. Well? Uh, I'm guessing that. I guess that these are photographs of plants or animal life, uh, either the uh, unknown up. Open them up? Yes. Open up the top. This one I don't want, these two I don't want to open. I want to see if I have been able to get this. I suppose I haven't. Uh, the, uh, the Latin names are a little complicated yes. down at the bottom. Mm -hmm. The first one that I showed uh, is a sort of saucer shaped object, luminous against the black background, right? With a, a few little brown things underneath. Uh, the second one, I think, was this one, which is a series of little, look like little lights, rather hazy, uh, in a circle, like port lights, with little, little streaks coming out. Now, I've got most of these matched to various types. Well, I buy a set this by taking these two. No, out. those were the end. You keep them there. Uh, I mean, I'm just going to be describing that they are lighted or luminous looking objects on a dark ground. I've now asked John and Silver to open them up, and these are photographs of a luminous animal. Some of them a very small size. Just lying around the ground, I know. Nearly all in water. In water. But they're of all kinds. Now, this ring of little dots is actually a, a kind of grub, the female uh, of a beetle found in, in uh, South America, which incidentally has uh, red and green light, it's called a spot and, a spot and go bug. When it's curled up and taken in full darkness, all you see is this little ring of light. Now, this different shaped object here, which looks like rather well, like an Adamski photograph, like a rather like, turns out to be a very small crustacean of a kind which is found in the sea off the coast of Japan. It happens to luminesce at night, semi-luminescent and so on. Now, I'm not bringing these things out to, to try and demonstrate. Don't, uh, don't no, say leave it up. Please, please. Right. Right. Uh, I'm not bringing them out to try and say that the uh, photograph shown to you, for instance, were faked, or that they faked them by photographing these small luminous animals, which are in every sea, in our woods, under a microscope, and then giving you a photograph of luminous animals the same as the flying saucer. Have these been published in any of the flying saucer's books? No, because no flying saucer book yet has ever come to what I'm building up to. They have never come to the 
biological aspect of this thing. Now these two here, I, I just wondered if I were a, if I was getting this correctly, are these uh, a photograph of egg beating? No. You may at any time this here looks to me like uh, the face uh, of an egg beater, possibly uh, set up on uh, a piece of black velvet or a photographic black paper and uh, just some light that are on it. Um, may I explain, John, uh, to your listeners that I have presented these photographs stuck on cards with a piece of brown paper over that card, tipped on, with a window cut in it to show just uh, this one photograph out of a series or a part of a photograph. By taking your fingers and lifting up the, the brown paper, you can see what they really are. They are pages taken out of... Uh, Dr. Harvey's book on animal life, and they are all animals or vegetables um, which luminesce at night with chemiluminescence. Uh, the two of the two we're looking at are the very small animals which are found in the sea of the jellyfish nature. Uh, they have in every way the appearance of many of the descriptions of different types of UFO. Now, I'm not saying the photographs of UFOs that are being presented by such gentlemen as Mr. Zansky are photographs of this nature. We have got in front of us two types, or two methods by which photographs could be faked. Mm -hmm. I refuse at this point to say whether I think the photographs have been printed or otherwise are faked or are not. That's another whole subject which I'd like to get off, if I may. I, I think I, I hope I've got you and I hope I've got some of your millions of listeners uh, to a point, of what, uh, and I hope that it is also uh, logical. I pointed out that life on the surface of our planet is incredibly, on the surface of our planet and in the waters of our planet, uh, is incredibly complex. Uh, and the numbers of forms are just simply go on and on. There are millions of life forms. Believing out, all this photograph business for a moment, but I have shown you things here which I'm sure you've never seen before, have you? No, I have not. Shape. They are called radiolaria, infusoria, globigerina. They're huge groups of single-celled animals which are found in every drop of water patch in the world. Diatom. Go into any biology class and look at a drop of, of uh, this water and you'll see cylinders, plenty cells, even saucers. Uh, triangular things. Yes, little saucer-like jars, little plate-like jars. Take some of your own blood and have a look at the plate that's in it. They're little blind saucers. It is too. The red, uh, the, uh, the red, uh, the red, uh, the red, the red, the red, the red, the red, In a liquid medium, it is preferable for an animal to adopt the most perfect of all forms, which is the globular form, I presume. Uh, for purposes of locomotion or for sitting on the bottom or going up and down, they become compressed out of the top to bottom or from side to side. Then comes the question of, of uh, tensile strength of the structure. Uh, gelatinous ones just go through the air like an amoeba. Uh, if they want to retain some kind of form, they will probably become hexagonal, triangular, uh, dodecahedrons, tetrahedrons, or, or you know, uh, various uh, geometric shapes. And these small animals that drift about the planks on the system, which we may all have to feed on one day, uh, which whales feed on, which most fishes feed on, is made up of millions of these little diatoms and things, and they're the most wonderful little shapes because they float suspended in the in the water. And uh, they, they take so long to sink, they never get anywhere, do you know what I mean? Uh, their whole life cycle is, is uh, passed through in the sinking of a few feet, perhaps. Uh, certain times of the year when the sea goes green, when lakes suddenly go sort of reddish, that is when you have what's called a flush of maybe bacteria or infusoria or one of these, one of these small protozoa type animals, uh, or bacteria in some cases, some luminous bacteria. You ever opened your, your refrigerator and found a fish that you've got in there for the next day glowing happily in the dark? I have. It's an alarming experience. Um, that is the type of bacteria which is lodged in the fish's scales. Those individual little bacteria are so small, they, uh, they, you, you cannot see, of course, in the naked eye. You have to get a quite powerful microscope to see each individual little, little one. They put out continuous cold light throughout their tiny little lives, which in proportion to their size, it's about 400 times that the power that goes into New York City. Uh, nature is a very, very wonderful thing. Now, I'm coming finally to my point. Why I brought these things up was to point out that the biologists have not yet had a say in this UFO business. 
Now, I would give credit to a, a Swedish gentleman who I've never met. I don't know who he is or where he is. His name is spelled Z-O-E, which I understand is the Polish way of saying Joe. Uh, Wasilko, W-A-S-I-L-K-O, hyphen Zarecki, S-E-R-E-C-K-I. I have talked about this myself a couple of times on the air, but very tangentially. This gentleman has developed a theory, and I give full credit to him for bringing it to my attention. I've been working on it for a year, and when I say working on it, I've been thinking of aspects of it and putting them down in, I hope, logic sequence. You know that, that animals feed on matter, material. Plants, on the other hand, feed half on matter and half on energy. They take the substances in liquid form out of the soil through their roots, and they take the combined sunlight by the use of chlorophyll and the energy of the sunlight combining with chemicals to build up their, their, uh, their food substances in which they build their bodies. So we have life forms in the surface of this earth which are living on matter entirely, or half matter and half energy. Now, nothing is impossible in nature, and it's in fact highly probable that there could be life forms. I'm not talking about animals, or viruses, or plants, but another type, a fourth type, but another type, a fourth type of life form, which feeds exclusively on energy. Where is energy of certain kinds to be obtained in purest form? Well, of course, all matter is energy, basically, but it's kind of locked up energy, isn't it? We're finding that out now with our fusion and our fission bombs. It takes an awful lot of power to get the, the locked up energy out of matter, or get it, or put it back in and gather it up and stick it in to make the matter stick together. It's in fusion. Where is uh, a lot of free energy of, of certain kinds available? Uh, at the outer limit of our atmosphere, where such energy is pouring upon us from the sun, for instance, and many other sources that we find now from uh, radio astronomy. Uh, this Polish gentleman's initial suggestion was that there may be life forms living up there of a high tenuous nature, which have, are enclosed in a bladder type thing, which for some reason, and I think he has good reason for saying this, and I just have a lot to try and go into the technicalities too much, probably contains a certain amount of certain quota of silicon uh, as its principal element. Uh, the inside may be a uh, sort of a gaseous mixture or parted gelatinous, uh, but most of it's the same. Um, that they um, will adopt certain forms, particularly the globular, the lenticular, i.e. the saucer, the ob oblate spheroid, I think it's called, the uh, cylindrical, perhaps when they're breeding, they will adopt like I have seen myself under the microscope. And uh, there are photographs of the... Uh, Ordinary uh, splitting of a cell in mitosis. Have a look at it sometime. The chromosomes, how they bunch themselves together and they, and they put out sort of strings between the male and the female one, which you say, or the X and Y. And uh, they put out sort of strings and all the chromosomes bunch together and then they join and then they split in the middle the other way, you know, so we get uh, sort of the generations that pass down to each cell. Uh, there are a small sea animals which come together at a certain time, but when I say the animals, these minute that I'm showing you here, the amoeba does it. Two amoeba will sort of flow together and insist, they make into a sort of a bigger one, and then they'll lie rest of the head, and then the skin bursts, and out come lots of little ones. Uh, there are other kinds where two come together and then are sort of plate-like, and they seem to throw out under the microscope little threads between them that makes like a little cylinder, X being at one end and Y at the other, and then they rest in that stage of the time, and then out of them come little pairs of little things which don't look like either the cylinder or the two parental objects. A very description of that I have never heard and given by Mr. Michel in the cases reported from all over the south of France. A sort of cylinder appearing in the sky for some hours, and little pairs of things coming out of it, dancing around in pairs, but whenever two of them touched, there was a blinding flash, and a lot of this stuff called angel hair came, came tumbling down. We'll get to that in a minute. His theory, and very much my theory, is that not all UFOs, but that there may be a very large class of life forms living on the outer edge of our atmosphere, which are hardly life forms. They're, in other words, they're entirely for natural, natural phenomenon. There could be such things. Now, everybody says, well, that's all very well, but wait a minute. Why don't we see them? Well, uh, I am not good at, at uh, optics. But uh, you know perfectly well that most of our tele telescopes are strained, uh, uh, strained, indeed they are, are trained on things outside our atmosphere. Uh, most of our meteorologists are straining their eyes on things inside our atmosphere. 
We are working like mad now, so is the Air Force. Everybody is to find out what goes on at the edge of our atmosphere. But uh, nobody's going to turn around and tell me that things haven't been seen floating about in the sky. They have. And they are just a type of form which, due to the natural environment, a natural object, which is not an inanimate object, and is neither an animal nor a plant nor a virus, but is, in other words, a life form, might take up. Then people say, well, wait, come, come. Some of these things are of enormous size to be reported. I'll take that up for one second. Then they say, oh, they travel so fast. Well, I, I'm no good as big as I, but I should have made some notes before I came. I'm sorry, John, but I will give them to you, and if you want to read on the air, I can either read them or I can send you a note, and you can read them yourself. If you take the density of water as a medium, uh, and the pressure of water at the bottom of the ocean, and uh, at the top of the ocean, and you compare it with the density of air at ocean level, and then on up through to our outer atmosphere, and you extrapolate, as it were, from what figures we have in water into the air, I don't mind making myself clear. An animal of such and such a size traveling in, in, in the medium known as water can develop a certain amount of energy only within its muscles. The most efficient of all is probably the blue whale, uh, which is just one great huge hunk of muscle, actually, and it can go at a tremendous speed. You can get a thing 113 foot long jumping clean out of the water. Um, it can go at a certain speed. Uh, in the atmosphere, in the lower atmosphere, things can travel much faster. Birds, for instance. As the atmosphere rarefies and goes up, the things could travel much faster still. And by pure extrapolation, uh, according to Mr. Wesselowski, and he said himself, he said, we've got to get somebody to go into the actual details of these figures, but about it. Uh, you, you can multiply the speed of something in water by 700, I think, uh, and you will get the speed at which an object of the same size or comparable size can travel in the atmosphere. Also, a matter of size. The harder you're pushed on from around, the, 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 be, uh, the better it is to be small. I mean, the, the looser the medium around you is, the bigger you can be without upsetting things. The enormous sizes reported to some UFOs are not at all with outside the bounds of a life form living in a rarefied atmosphere and feeding exclusively on the radiant energy. Now, may I ask you a question that occurs to me? Following your thoughts now, is it conceivable? That as this life, if, uh, if this life, life exists, life form. this life form exists, as it gets closer and closer to the light source, which on Earth our plant life uses, uh, it could conceivably move it just at the speed of light. That's a lovely thought. I haven't gone that far. It's not one that anybody's brought up before. Uh, to that, I would have to ask some very minded physicist like Dr. Higginbotham or somebody who does have a slight uh, interest in the biological aspects of these things. I may make a note of that and forget it for a moment, but I can remember it for myself. It's a great thought. Um, but I would, in the meantime, uh, like to try and confine myself to the bounds of possibility, as well as prob well, possibility, everything is possible, probability of the surface of our planet and its uh, uh, atmospheric envelope as we know it at the present day. We're finding out a lot of things about it which we didn't know before. You know, the old idea was that Ferdy went out into the place the colder and colder you got. Well, as you know now, uh, this great uh, layer up there that's real hot. Um, uh, about, uh, please let me stress, and stress and stress again, that I do not say that all UFOs uh, could be or, or must be or may be or are to be explained by this theory put forward by this knowledge. Uh, fellow originally. Uh, on the other hand, I'm going to give you some, some uh, I hope, real shockers and then this particular theory. Uh, I, uh, not a, uh, I can't have the time or the facilities to put over the theory without visual aids and an awful lot of discussion and explaining myself. And I'm sure all of you are itching to get at my throat and say, well, what about this and what about that? Uh, I'm only trying to give you the conjecture which goes behind this theory. And I believe by me, it is quite a theory, but quite a lot to it. There are certain aspects of it which, which uh, have made me more deeply interested in this. Of, uh, no, not more deeply interested uh, in this aspect of UFOs than any other, but have made me work more on it because I am a trained biologist and my whole life is with animals, with life forms of one kind and another. I would just like to point out a number of different ways in which uh, UFOs, as described by the poor, long suffering, bleeding public who have seen these things throughout the ages and have coughed at, uh, take heart, dear soul, because the number of things that some of your UFOs, uh, you reported doing, are the natural 
heavy of life forms, particularly of animals, as a matter of fact. I live with animals, I know. Don't think that animals, we're the only, only animals in the, in the universe that have intelligence. If you've ever watched a cat stalking a, a mouse or a bird, both the bird, the mouse, and the cat are certainly using intelligence. An intelligence of a very advanced, uh, advanced form. The cat is thinking out his next move. It's not all instinctive. And if, if anybody can tell me the difference between instinct and reason, they better get on the air right sharp and prove it. Now, take some of the things that these creatures do. I'll come even to the sudden stop and turn. Uh, any animal, could, uh, any life form which could travel uh, at 15,000 miles an hour. And some of these things have been alleged to do just that. People, uh, 90,000 people say this is absolutely ridiculous. By extrapolation uh, of what animals can do in a liquid medium, or bowing under the earth to start with moles and things, how slowly they get along. So moles go rather rapid, as a matter of fact. Anyhow, things bowing along under the earth take a longer time. They have to shove their way through. They have to use a lot of muscular energy. Uh, animals in water can uh, travel faster and more freely. Animals in air can travel faster still. If you get up into practically nowhere, they could travel at enormous speeds. And that wonderful point that Sylvia brought up, which I'm going to think about very deeply, is it not possible that the closer they get to the source of their, their energy, the faster they may be able to go? Of course, I've got some nasty ones coming in a minute when we come to another aspect of ufology. That is the whole question of teleportation and the possibility of, trans and of, of uh, transgressing the speed, speed of light, which, as Einstein said, just before he died, is only a theoretical point just the same as the speed of sound is, is a relative point. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, I was told that no aeroplane would ever surpass the sound barrier because uh, air became virtually spot and solid at that point, and it'd be like driving an aeroplane into a brick wall. Of course, all the silly people who were telling me had all forgotten the bullets and things been going through it for a very long time. It'd been overlooked that for fact. Uh, unless this business of running into a brick wall, incidentally, uh, will bring me back to what I'm talking about, you both. Uh, you know the ordinary cockchafer or, or June bug, the big beetle which comes bobbling along? Uh, it is made of, of, of stuff, uh, it's a natural plastic, it's exoskeleton, the hard shell of it. Yeah. But it is a very less thin indeed. It, it's a something of a millimeter in thickness only. And yet, one of those beetles can, can drive straight into a brick wall at up to 50 miles an hour, bang, bang into the wall, fall down on the ground, get up and walk away. I'd like to see some of our beetles travel to the speed of 50 miles an hour. Oh, yeah. There is a lake, you just say, oh, yes. <laughs> oh, there's, there's, there's uh, uh, insects that travel at enormous speeds, but the surface flies. There's a certain surface fly. You know that when you go into a, into a pine wood and you see this thing looks like a, like a yellow jacket that's hovering in the air and suddenly it's somewhere else? Sort of egg beater style, a uh, helicopter thing. It was alleged by one scientist, and of course he was immediately uh, flopped on the head for having said so, but I believe that <laughs> he wasn't too far off from the work of other people, it was alleged to have been able to travel at 800 miles an hour. Uh, well, that's before anybody had broken the sound barrier, and there was an up uproar, especially over the top of the Mexican mountain. Uh, I don't know, I, uh, I bring it up uh, more as a joke then, because uh, he did say it uh, in scientific print. And he, he got uh, warm. That was the end of him for a time. But they have found that animals do travel uh, flying. Animals dig the insects the smaller they are, the faster they can uh, they can get along. And the beetle is a particularly fast thing, really, and efficient as well. But I'm thinking the other aspect of it: flying into a brick wall would make it only 40 or 30. You try driving your car into a brick wall at 40 miles an hour. Uh, I'd like to see some steel produced, which has the tensile strength of the material of which the outside shell of a beetle is made, considering how, how thin it is. Uh, we've got a long way to go. Uh, anyhow, back to these uh, UFOs, which, uh, those ones which might possibly be a life form. Uh, the enormous speed would not, must be intolerable. Um, anything that can go at that enormous speed, uh, obviously it does not suffer from, um, from uh, too many Gs, as it were, in acceleration. Also, if they can go so fast, they can stop so fast. And uh, if they stop so fast, uh, they can go off at another angle. In other words, they don't make a right angle turn. They come to a dead stop and go off in another direction. Uh, that is possible. But I don't think that this type uh, really do that very often. I think that belongs in entirely another category of UFOs. We deal principally with this kind. I'll get to dispose of them first. Just a few other points. I've shown you photographs of luminous animals in the sea, a fungus, bacteria, fish, almost every form of life 
know has luminous uh, members. I found a luminous beetle in a cave in Trinidad. I immediately got bothered for that. But uh, all along the side of it, another plant is found light organs. And there are luminous fish. There is one bird, uh, the young of this particular bird in Australia, where really, uh, uh, little birds open their mouths to be fed. And sometimes the inside of the mouth is luminous, not because they are luminous, but because there are luminous bacteria have lodged in there. Uh, the theory is that um, the mother can find them more easily in the dark. There are sponges which are luminous. There are um, jellyfish, there are squids. Now, squids are particularly interesting. They are cigar shaped. And they have, like, pot lights all around the side. And they are vivid. Some of the deep sea squids that have been brought up in the Indian Ocean have four different colored rows of pot lights along the side. Uh, if you like, I have to look through some more of these photographs and see some of those squids. There's a fish called uh, Photoblepharon, which I caught when I was quite a youngster, in the Band of Sea, uh, off the coast of the Moluccas. And uh, there was off the coast of Salabi. They went marvelous, sort of rather dreary looking little fish, rather sort of cold, just a bit like a porgy. And under the eyes, which of course fish's eyes don't have any eyelids, uh, it has a sort of like another eye, really a poppy. Now, this is sort of like a poppy, but there's a little bit of a sort of like another eye, really a poppy, a sort of uh, kidney shaped pocket underneath each eye with a, a movable lid, as it were. And in this pocket, in some extraordinary way, this fish manages invariably to gather an enormous amount of luminous bacteria, which uh, just live in there like a sort of parasite live happily there, glowing away all the time. And when the fish wants to see his food on the bottom, he simply opens his little shutters and he gets two little headlights pointing down onto the, onto the crown. It's the most amazing thing to see. We had some in a bucket and it was all dark. Suddenly two little headlights came on so he could see the ground in front of him. Now, I come back to the, to the luminous squid and the happy port light effects along the side. You'll see others there. There's that uh, wonderful spot and go bug. Uh, which has red lights for uh, going, for stopping, and green lights for going, presumably. It really does have red and green lights on it. It lives in, uh, all the time inside a dark log in, uh, in the Brazilian jungle. Now, a lot of these uh, UFOs have been reported to have these brilliant port lights along the side, some of which are circular, some of which are log in shape, some of which are square, and the pilots have described the lights as being so dark it tends to look like a mercury flare inside, the witted case, for instance. So the idea of light forms having a self-luminosity or carrying their own light uh, is not in any way beyond the bounds of possibility. In fact, it's highly probable. Now, um, if these things uh, get their food and their energy and were evolved to live in rarefied atmosphere, or even perhaps just that may be right outside the atmosphere, actually in interstellar space, there may be things drifting about. After all, if they can feed exclusively on energy, and we know there's matter all through space now in a very tenuous form, they might be able to pick up enough matter to make a sort of um, sphere, you see, or whatever other shape, cigar or lens. And it is interesting that many, in fact, nearly all cases report that the outsides of these animals look more or less like aluminum. Most fish have a sort of silvery look, don't they? Very true. They uh, might think like the devil if they came down too low and got drowned in our atmosphere. They would drown probably in our atmosphere. Uh, this is a non-technical way of putting it. Uh, if they come down too far. On the other hand, uh, another aspect of this fellow's theory is, is, is certainly delightful. These things have always been seen in the sky. They sometimes drift down. Maybe they get sick and go down, like when whales go, when uh, squids get sick, they come up. Uh, but they have been appearing, if you take a map, and map the appearance of UFOs, uh, as uh, Dr. Davidson said last night, they're always turning up in radio beams. Also, they occur much more frequently over atomic energy plants, over large cities, exactly, over all the places where we are broadcasting, telecasting, putting out masses and masses of electromagnetic energy, which didn't in the old days used to be put out of these places. These things get their food from above, but they can begin to get a certain food from below. They, being life forms, come down to do a bit of investigating. Maybe they can come down with a very strong radio beam and bathe in the radio beam, pick up a certain amount of electrical energy from that, but they need very little being so tenuous. Would they, uh, pardon me, Ivan, would they affect our radar? Naturally, they would. They're solid objects. They may not be very solid, but they are, they're not hallucinations. They're things. And, of course, they would affect our radar. They'd pick up a bit. Also, they the a perfect explanation of the food fighters. Uh, also, I was in uh, a couple of intelligence services for 10 years before and during the war. Uh, naval intelligence in the Caribbean. 
and I had Deborah's instructions from on high to please stop reporting green lights. We thought that they were the enemy signaling to each other. What happened, what really blew it up, was this in the end. Uh, one of these green glowing objects landed on a road in Curacao when 500 British troops were marching from uh, Wilhelmina Port up to take over the oil fields after the fall of Holland and landed in front of the officer on the road one of these things. And I don't know whether the officer being good British or said charge or forward men, but anyhow, they chased this thing and it, it played the uh, tag with them. It would bounce along and disappear into the gutter, run along to the, the culvert, duck through and come out the other side and sort of wait for them and then run away in front of them. And it finally just went up the sky and disappeared. And uh, from then on, the Admiralty decided that, that uh, these things, most of the green lights, are probably natural phenomena. Indeed, they are. Now, the food fighters, the activity of that thing, the activity of the food fighters, and much of the behavior of many UFOs is exactly that of an animal. They are inquisitive. And when people say they seem to be intelligently controlled, they are, because all animals are intelligent in a matter of degree, even the bumbling opossum. Uh, and anything that's moved at high speed has probably got to have some kind of uh, intelligence. Of course, it's a bad word, because maybe they'll be able to find it. But in other words, they are intelligently directed from within, do you get me? And they come down and play tag with, uh, with the aeroplane. It's one of what they are. They smell of metal. They're giving out energy all over. Come bounce along and pick up a little food while we're on the way. These funny great bubbling things that come up. You know, all the things that come up from the bottom of the sea, we're amazed. And then, whoa, look at this curious thing called the Kraken. We've got, it's now known as Archicutus, a squid, which can grow with its tentacles up to over 30 foot long. Uh, for years and years, it was laughed at as a sea monster, and now everybody, every museum has pieces of them. In fact, they use them as the debate with the cod fishers out in the Grand Banks, have done all the way through. But one professor, Beryl, could probably actually go up there and catch one. But we're amazed at some of the things that come up from the bottom of the sea in these deep sea fish. These things are probably just as amazed as, as giving them a, a anthropomorphic connotation. But they're looking for food like everything else. And they're not going to run into a plane. They can move much faster than the plane. They can play around with it, dodge away in front of it. A lot of these other things that come down low, like that horse coast master who was reported to have got seriously burnt by one of these things in the Florida swamp, do you remember? Yes, he I went remember. Heard about it. Well, now, to take a, a life form feeding on energy, it must have a it must be able to store energy. Electric eels can store, oh my goodness, what a lot of electricity can store in its storage batteries. These things are, are little powerhouses of their own. Coming down here, buzzing around the Florida swamp, maybe got lost or tired or sunk to the bottom or got in a wrong convection current or something. And he's, he's floating down there, feeling probably quite uncomfortable because there's tremendous air pressure around him, which he's not used to. And I'm uh, making this part of human, as you say, I'm trying to explain uh, animal intelligence and behavior, rather. Behavior is a better word. And up comes a human being, and out of all innocence, goes up and gets too close or even touches it, and whammo, he gets a terrific electric shock. Uh, I'm using the word electricity to uh, again oversimplify, because um, the different types of electricity electromagnetic waves that are the range is enormous. And so there may be one kind that feeds in, in this wave range, another one here, and there may be thousands and hundreds, perhaps millions of different kinds of these creatures. And their behavior, I say, is definitely that of a life form. And I could go on indefinitely giving you such, uh, such cases, such correlations between reports of UFOs and animal behavior. But now let me, I've done that, so let me cut that out and say, I would not attempt to put any percentage on those which I think might be life forms. I, I, I try to be uh, objective and particularly scientific. I'm interested, in other words, in the exploration, the investigation of the unknown by the use of personal imagination, and secondly by hypotheses. Um, we need facts. I don't know if anybody's got a UFO yet. I very much doubt that this animal type or this life form type could be got. <laughs> Because apparently, when they get down to our atmosphere, they dissolve. They proceed to dissolve. And uh, sometimes when they clash amongst themselves, there seems to be a discharge of some kind, and this angel pair comes down. You know the case of the policeman in Philadelphia? We saw it land on the pavement. He's very shy of it. He went over and picked it up. I can bring you four or five witnesses from up uh, in our Warren County who saw a similar thing. And they went and picked this stuff off the trees. And uh, you know the old theory that it's migrating spiders 
And they put out a web and then they go blowing on it. Well, there's a spider's web. You can tell spider's web put on the microscope. It's a string with little drops of oil on it. This stuff, they picked it up, and as they put it on their hands, it becomes jelly. And then it just simply seems to dissolve right inside you. Um, other people, I believe that Donald Kehoe has uh, some locked up in a bottle or had some at one time. And when it was let out, it has no structure that we can find. I don't know whether he's had that analyzed. I think two or three people have tried to do it, but they never even get it to a lab. It just dissolves in spite you. Uh, it goes away. In other words, it dissolves in our atmosphere. This backwards case was very interesting because we subsequently discovered that these, those things there, which look much more like machines, I must admit, uh, come over the mountains and hit an updraft. There have been big forest fires, Monsanto chemical, all those collieries, and the atmosphere at the crest of the mountains where they came over was highly charged with carbonation matter. And they seem to be unable to cope with, with carbonation matter in a, in a gauge of form or particles. They may have clogged their breathing vents, be they machines or animal life forms. And they all went out of gear at the same time. One managed to land, two got away from the on the outside edge. Don't forget it was number one and number six who did so keep on going. And the other two crashed and one blew up in the air or it sort of came apart in the air, came unstuck. And the ashes that fell out of it, as William saw, was nothing else but uh, the beginning of, of uh, angel's hair. Or, as Charles Fork says, there have been rains of the substance which looks exactly like blood. There have been rains of ashes. There have been rains uh, which would show a certain carbonation content. Supposing you had one of these things a mile and a half long. It might be so tenuous that you could, uh, without the energy stored in it, you could drive a plane through it. And you'd only come up with a sticky mass all over you. But there still is an enormous amount of material in there in a very tenuous form. Supposing it dies. I suppose they die sometimes when they run out of energy or something goes wrong with their mechanism. I mean, when I'm speaking of biology, it's a biological mechanism. When it runs out, they die, and what are you left with? A certain amount of carbon, silicon, and so on. And the end product, as it falls very rapidly through the increasingly dense atmosphere, um, will burn up just like a meteor. And all you get is ashes, of course, hence your range of carbonaceous matter. Uh, your range of blood may be uh, of a similar nature. Maybe the, the heavy part it may have a certain amount of liquid in it, and so on and so forth. In your umbrella. However, uh, let us, for pure theoretical purposes, let us say that 80% of UFO reports are dealing with life forms. Or they are, uh, they are. Get them out of the way. Uh, there is no other, we come to another whole group, then, or the possibility of another whole group. There's no reason whatsoever why there should not be other intelligence, uh, other forms of life, universe of the level of our intelligence or above it. And uh, if, uh, nobody can deny the possibility that uh, intelligence of our level or higher, right up to the almost godlike, need not be contained in a body such as we have, made of hydrogen and carbon principally, uh, which is highly suitable to our planet, but on other planets, not going necessarily going around our sun, going around other sun. And in the, how many suns are there in our galaxy of the size of our sun? I think it's 400 million or something, or 400,000 million or something like that. In our galaxy alone, and according to the theories of Kuiper of Chicago and Weizsäcker of Germany, uh, planets are a natural concomitant of the formation of a sun. When the sun starts with a whirling lepicell or disc, as it contracts, uh, the heavy matter flies out like the centrifuge, and the light matter goes to the middle and makes the sun, and automatically, by a very complicated thing of world, you'll eventually gather up all the heavy matter and make the planet. And there will always be a set of planets going around every sun. Well, every sun is the same size as ours, probably got a set of the same number of planets, or about the same average size, according to Bose's law, anyhow. Uh, I throw that in for the best of the astronomers. Um, and the third planet out will probably be very equivalent to Earth. Uh, there is such a thing in nature known to biologists as parallel evolution, you know. Uh, one animal living on one continent can, over millions of years, uh, due to the same things that it has to do, develop into looking almost exactly like a completely different animal on another continent. Uh, they're not related in any way, genetically, uh, but they come to look almost identical. That's called parallel evolution. There's no reason why even human-like looking mammals couldn't be developed on a planet going around another star of the same size as ours. The sun is being made of the same material as we, uh, we know through uh, spectroscopic analysis and so on. Um, therefore, there's no reason why there should not be uh, life forms with intelligences such as ours, who, in other words, who can build machines, who would want to build machines, and who might go flying in them. Uh, we cannot discredit the possibility uh, that there could be, in other words, man, and I've used man in, in, in quotes, uh, man UFOs, which are machines, structures, 
uh, guided by an intelligence either riding in that machine or controlling it robotically from a distance from a mothership. There is no reason why that category could also not be included. Uh, this has been a presentation of the tape-recorded UFO Information Service, a non-profit organization, and Dr. A.G. Dittmar, General Coordinator, H.M. Henriksen, Technical Director.